So welcome everyone to this webinar on submissions of parallel not distribution notifications for centralized products. My name is Virginia Rojo. I'm scientific specialist in the procedures office and team lead for the parallel distributions team. So we've organized this webinar basically to give you an overview on how to submit initial notifications and annual updates via IRIS to discuss the most frequently made mistakes and also provide some advice on requirements for particular types of products. So before we start, I just wanted to remind everyone that this webinar will be recorded and the video will be available in our website. So we will start with some housekeeping rules for the day. So please mute yourselves, make sure that your microphone is muted because we have a high number of participants. So unless you're given the floor to speak, please uh, make sure that you close your phones. Also include any questions in the chat. You can do that during any time during the presentations. We will be monitoring all the questions and providing replies. And then at the end of all presentations, we will have a Q&A session. Uh, and during that session, we will reply to as many questions in the chat as we can. But uh, even if there is not enough time to reply to all of them, we will compile all the questions in a Q&A document that will be published in our website. And that's why we request you to include all the questions that you may have in the chat so we can compile them all. Uh, in the document, so all of them will have a reply, even if we don't have time to cover them during the session. So you can also use the chat function if you want to take the floor, or even better, you can raise your hand using the WebEx functionality. And once you're given the floor, please just indicate uh, your name and affiliation when introducing yourselves. I would just ask you to wait until the Q&A session uh, to ask for the floor. And in case you have any urgent technical issues or connection problems, you can contact the email that uh, you can see here in the slides on the screen. And again, to remind everybody that the webinar will be recorded. And uh, please uh, mute yourselves if you are not speaking, because we have a high number of participants today. And uh, it's inevitable that there is no noise. So you can see here the topics that we'll be covering today. Uh, we're already in the introduction, so we will start with uh, some technical aspects on OMS and IRIS, and that'll be followed by a video demo on the submission on initial notifications in IRIS. Then there will be a presentation on initial notifications, followed by a presentation on annual updates, and we will finalize with some product-specific requirements. So at the end of the presentation, we will start the Q&A session. Uh, we will start with the questions that uh, we received during the registration process and that were not covered in any of the previous presentations. And then we will move to the questions on the chat. So as I say, all the questions will be compiled in a document and they will be published. So you will have uh, res the responses there for you to check. So as you can see, there is a lot of information to cover today but uh, we really hope that you find it interested, uh, interesting and that uh, you enjoy the session. So with that, I would just like to introduce the first speaker, Anna Fyodorova, who will be discussing some technical aspects on OMS and IRIS. So Anna, over to you. Thank you, Virginia. Dear participants, we would like to welcome you today to the webinar. It's really nice to see so many of you today after quite a long break in this type of events. So, um, next slide, please. So, uh, dear participants, we would like to once again welcome you uh, at today's webinar. It's our pleasure to see so many of you here today after quite a long break in this type of events. So, it's really great to see you here. So, um, I will start today our session with the technical part uh, and which will cover IRIS and OMS related items. Um, we'll also go through difference between our SCMA and Service Desk and touch on general advice such as um, 
reminder about different IRIS user roles, about the importance of a contact point and managers on the submission, and also remind you about the IRIS forums, which is an open public platform for your use. Next slide, please. So um, IRIS, first of all, consumes OMS data on the organization and locations. So OMS, for those of you who might not be fully aware, is organization management service, and it maintains all organization and location data. Um, so whenever a new organization is created in OMS, it appears in IRIS quite shortly after. However, if a change is needed to an existing organization, such as a change in the name or a change in address, it first has to be recorded in OMS, and then a respective change request, meaning a notification of a change in name and address, has to be submitted in IRIS in order for us to conduct regulatory check and approve the change. So in principle, OMS simply records the change in the address, while Parallel Distribution Secretariat, in this case, will perform the regulatory um, check on the reported change. Repackagers being organizations as well also maintain the information in the OMS and the changes to the repackagers details can be um, made by the repackagers themselves or any other user who holds the required documentation to support the change. So bear this in mind. Um, another important aspect which we would like to invite you to pay attention to is that all PG notifications must be submitted from the address or location ID which corresponds to the legal address on your wholesale distribution uh, license. This is an important item and we'd like you to, um, to bear this in mind when making submissions. Um, also, I'd like to take this opportunity to highlight the difference and the purpose um, and different type of support provided by uh, two platforms for uh, interaction with stakeholders. So to begin with, Service Desk is your purely technical support channel for parallel distribution um, related. Um, items. So whenever you have any issues related to access to IRIS or any other EMA systems, if you have problems with the submission process, with the outcome of the process, with the data on the public register, or with um, organization data in OMS, this is your um, contact point um, service desk. Basically, it's your IT support. Now, for anything which relates to procedures, to product information, to general inquiries. This is the Ask EMA. If you have uh, doubts about annexes to the marketing authorization, to the content of those uh, documents, to the publication, or any PD procedures related questions, just submit your query to Ask EMA. Thank you. Um, I would like also to stress the importance of the detailed description of the issue which you're having in, in the service desk. So service desk colleagues support internal and external queries, um, applicants. Therefore, it is really important that you provide detailed description of the issue that you are facing. So begin with clearly indicating which platform you are um, experiencing problems on provide organization name and ideally location ID or organization ID. If you hold a um, submission number or draft number, also provide it. In case when it is not possible to make a submission and you're facing uh, technical issues, then uh, include product information, pharmaceutical form, EU presentation number. Um, it will also be helpful to us if you support your request with print screens. And the key message here is the more detailed you are, the faster your ticket will be routed to the correct recipient. That will really help us to help you. And additionally, I would like to go through um, several general advice items, uh, such as, for example, uh, multiple managers on, on the submission. And as you are aware, the person who makes the submission uh, becomes also the contact point by default and becomes the manager of that submission. So it is um, um, 
really important that you know the difference between various access roles given to um, IRIS users. And we invite you to um, refer to IRIS Guide to Registration and to the table, which I have included in this slide, to familiarize yourself with the type of actions each user has um, uh, for that, um, for one or another user role. So um, the managers have uh, permission uh, to change the contact points, meaning the person who will be receiving notifications. They can upload the documents, they can add additional managers. So it is very important that you add at least two managers, or maybe even more, to every submission that you make. And it is important in case of um, long-term absences or long-term leaves um, prior to, let's say, long summer, summer is approaching, prior to holiday, it would be a good practice if you assign your cases to, uh, to your colleagues before you, uh, you go on a leave to ensure the continuity. And the next slide, which is um, my last slide, um, is a reminder that we do have a forum on IRIS homepage and we'd invite, uh, we'd invite you to use it. And it's, um, it's a public platform which uh, provides updates on IRIS features and allows um, applicants to interact and share best practice. So we also publish the updates there and uh, whenever applicable, we answer uh, questions and technical questions sometimes. So this concludes the technical part of the presentation for today and I hand over the floor to my colleagues who will walk you through a submission process and some difficult or more complex um, items in the submission process. Good afternoon colleagues, my name is Asta and I will be talking you through a video um, of um, initial notification submission. So uh, let me just stop it there, just to let you know uh, for one second that this video was pre-recorded and you will have it yourselves after this meeting. The uh, sound was not super good, uh, so what we're trying to do, we're trying to make it much better for you. I will talk over the video. If I'm late or I had a little bit of time, uh, please excuse me, uh, but I will try to keep with the video that I recorded previously. So I already logged into IRIS um, submission portal and I go to submissions and my draft submissions. Then create new submission. And in this part, are you applying as an individual or on behalf of organization? I always choose organization, never the individual. The next step is choosing the organization on behalf of which you're applying. And in this case, I will choose European Medicines Agency. And this is a test environment. For yourselves, you, of course, choose your own company name. For the, again, for the test purposes, I will choose United Kingdom. Please ignore this for the moment. Just follow the technical part. In the location, you choose the location that, as Anna said, is associated with your legal address on WDA, Wholesale Distribution License, and select it. And here, since I'm creating an initial notification, it, I will choose initial notification or whatever you type, and click search, and then select. Now we are going to the next step, which is add managers and contributors. And you can do that through the add buttons. It is advisable to choose a couple of managers and contributors for the case. And these are the buttons which, when clicked, will bring your own colleagues that you want to add to the case. And then continue to submission form. So this is when the submission number is generated. And now you have a draft with the name of the procedure, initial notification, and the number, which you may want to jot down. Then we have a list of requirements that we need to fill in with the information, and they will have a green tick after that. 
I'm sure you, most of you are aware of that. The only, um, the only one that you don't need to submit is the EMA documents. So parallel distributor information in the purchase order or reference number, you put whatever you need. This is your reference number, and this will appear on your invoice. And the customer account number is your customer account number. Please make sure you don't make mistakes there, just because it will be allocated, the invoice will be allocated to a different company. Then, uh, details of centrally authorized product. And in this case, I will be choosing Remsima. Uh, to make it more complicated, uh, I will choose not 001, but I will choose 007. Uh, you click, select, and then you decide according to what you need to do, if you're changing pack size, if you're sourcing a different pack size or not. I will be choosing for demonstration purposes to add a different pack size. And again, it's Remsima. I'm making sure that I can source this pack size. And in this case, I'll choose 006. Now I'm finished with this, save and return. If you click return, the information will not be saved. Save and return saves the information. A member states of origin and destination. Again, member states of origin. You choose whatever you need. Uh, in most cases, you will most probably choose quite a lot. For demonstration purposes, I have chosen several countries only. And then I add the country of destination. And I have chosen Latvia. If you don't tick, uh, it will, of course, not be submitted. So um, the system will show you that you haven't done something. In specific mechanism, I am choosing not needed. If you choose um, something for specific mechanism, you have to put the date in of the letter, of your specific mechanism letter. Then I choose the repackages. In this case, again, European Medicines Agency. I make sure that this company that I choose has secondary repackaging authorized. So in this case, it's of course demonstration. And in the text field, I put the MIA number, the authorization number of one or several companies that I have chosen. I have chosen one, so it will be one number. And again, save and return. Nature of repackaging. Um, the system is asking, is modification to the packaging proposed? In parallel distribution case, it's always a yes. In case your system lets you choose no, do not do that. Please leave it at yes, because we always, in parallel distribution, change something about the packaging. The next point is choosing um, how we are going to release the product. It's relabeling, reboxing, or we are going to do both. And in this case, I have chosen reboxing. And I choose to let EMA know why I have chosen that. You don't have to do that. It's a free text field. But um, if you feel like the information is needed, please put it here. And then uh, you put the latest annex information, which is the date. And at the point of this video, when I recorded it, it was the 1st of February. So I choose the correct date. And I save and return. To save the, all the information that I've just put in so that I don't have to do it again. Then documents from applicant. You can see all the documents that are required. The, um, those requirements may change from time to time. The system is evolving. Um, and for demonstration, I will only add one document. But you will have to add, of course, more documents than one through the add files. And this, uh, you see overwrite existing files option. Um, as time goes on, it will be deleted. 
it doesn't work anymore, please do not choose it. We need to um, submit the files uh, with a new date if you submit something again. So don't override the files. You add the files, this is fairly self-explanatory. And as I said, I added one file, but you will need to add more, whatever you require for this. And you have to confirm that you have added the files. So click yes. And again, the same process, save and return. Documents from EMA are the documents that EMA will um, put in and you will see them. And then you go to <clears throat> declaration. Click all the points. And I suggest reading them carefully, even though you have seen them many times, um, especially the fee payable on submission. And then um, submit application. First of all, I confirm uh, that I'm a person authorized to sign this application. I go to declaration and submission, and you have two options, either submit or review application. You can review it at this point if you have forgotten something, if you want to recheck it, uh, if you're not entirely sure, um, review application. And I'm sure of mine, so I click submit. And it may take a little bit of time to actually transfer the data to EMA systems. And then once this is done, you will see that the application has been submitted. And that is the end of my video. The only point I would like to add that this applies both to human and veterinary products. So this is the end of my um, presentation and video, which you will find later within the documents that we will send on. Thank you. And now I believe it's um, my colleague Inga. Uh, thank you, Asta. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, my name is uh, Kinga, and today I'm going to present you the second uh, part of the presentation on the initial notifications. And uh, in this part of the presentation, we will still remain on the subject of the initial notifications, but can I have the next slide? Thank you. We will uh, mainly focus on the following uh, topics. Um, there will be the checks performed by the EMA assessors during the validation and the regulatory stage. Uh, what are the most common errors uh, in the submission form uh, leading to invalidation or uh, later uh, during the regulatory check that might lead to a negative outcome. I will also provide clarification on the differences between uh, the mock-up and the labeling, and also remind what are the requirements for both of them. Uh, we will also uh, briefly touch upon the naming convention, remind what are the annex requirements and where to, where to look for the latest version of an annex, and of course the checklist and other parallel distribution guidance uh, documents. Can I have the next slide? So the process of the approval of the initial notifications is divided into two stages, the validation and the regulatory check. So during the validation, we check the correctness of the information on the submission form and the case documentation. So we check whether the details of the applicants uh, whether the submission is made from the legal address and the legal address corresponds to the wholesale distribution authorization. For the repackager, it has to be the manufacturing site address, uh, again, corresponding to the address in the NIA document. And also we check other information on the submission form. We check uh, source presentations, member states of origin, member states of destination, repackaging methods, and we check if the date of the annex is correct. For the case uh, documentation, we check whether documents are submitted for the correct product, for the correct EU number, uh, whether the documents 
are in the correct format and if the file naming convention is observed. Uh, in case of validation comments, um, a validation email will be sent out. So the validation comments must be addressed before the regulatory check can start. So the regulatory check uh, focuses on the content of the submitted documentation. So we check whether the patient leaflet, instructions, patient alert cards, if present in the annex, are in line with the latest annex, uh, if they are in the sales version. We check whether the mock-up contain all relevant information required by the annex. And we also check uh, the images in the labeling file, uh, whether, uh, the, the, whether um, they are visible, good quality, and uh, also we check labels for the inner packaging. Um, please note, my colleague already mentioned, but please note that the application process uh, for the human and veterinary products is the same, is the same application in IRIS. The only differences uh, result from the veterinary legislation, for example, is the absence of uh, Braille or and, sorry, and um, FMD uh, features on the outer carton. Can I have the next slide? Um, so this slide will uh, outline the most common errors that will lead to invalidation of a submitted case, as please remember that the form cannot be amended once uh, it has been submitted. So, for example, um, if the submission is made by an individual rather than organization, if you remember, my colleague Asta has mentioned this in the demo, if the submission is made from the different address than the legal address for the applicant, and the, the, uh, for, for the manufacturer, uh, for, for the repackager from the manufacturing site address, and they have to both correspond to uh, WDA for the applicant and MIA for the repackager. We also check whether the member states of origin are not the same as member states of destination distribution. Uh, of course, we have a few exceptions. Um, well, exceptions is the countries that share the same language, for example. Austria and Germany. However, in this case, uh, the same rule applies. The product cannot be uh, sourced and distributed from the same country. So we will expect to see a statement from the parallel distributor uh, somewhere in the maybe comment field, comments field or in the cover letter, if uh, such is attached to the submission, uh, saying that the product will not be sourced and distributed from the, in the same country. Uh, we also check um, repackaging. Uh, we also um, uh, wrong repackaging methods may lead to invalidation. And please remember that the outer carton always defines the repackaging method. If we have, for example, a, a reboxing and relabeling selected as repackaging method, we expect to see two sets of documents uh, for the outer carton. So. If the submitted documentation does not support the selected uh, repackaging method, the case will have to be unfortunately invalidated. In case of multipacks with intermediate packaging, there is still the outer carton that defines the repackaging method. Also, source presentations of pharmaceutical forms, uh, which cannot be used as source presentations, cannot be used as distributed. For example, um, a source syringe cannot be distributed as syringe with the needle guard. Um, tablets cannot be distributed as, uh, as vials. So please also pay attention when you select it um, in IRIS. Um, in case of the same presentation being sourced and distributed, please select um, uh, no in IRIS. Select only yes if you sourced a different presentation from the distributed. And the last one are repackages. If repackages are wrong or there is a wrong information about them, for example, if repackages don't have a valid MIA document, 
uh, or if there's if they don't have uh, secondary packaging or batch certification authorized please also note that in case of multiple repackagers only one of them must have a secondary packaging or batch certification authorized can i have the next slide Um, this slide uh, outlines the most frequent scenarios that might lead to uh, invalidation or negative outcome. And please note that the list is not exhaustive. For more information, please check the parallel distribution FAQ page, uh, question 9, when you, when you will see more examples. So what are the examples, examples selected? Administrative errors in the submission form, the one I've just mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, so there's no changes to the form after the form has been submitted. However, please note that after a submission is made, uh, the applicant has a 24 hours cooling off period to withdraw an application, and this is free of charge, in case of any errors detected. So the whole application has to be withdrawn. And the new application made with correct information. Also for the missed uh, response deadlines, uh, please note that the applicant has a 25 days in total to address all the comments from validation and regulatory check. In case of no comments, for example, for validation, the 25 days will, can be used for regulatory check. However, in case of comments for both, the 25 days will have to be split between two. In case of unauthorized changes to the, to the documentation or submission form, or if comments are implemented only partially, and if there is no clarification provided for non-implementation. Sometimes, um, if there are additional changes or national requirements and the parallel distributor wants to add it or remove something from the, from the either outer carton or other documents, it has to be, the assessor must be notified in writing because this is not what is requested by us. So we, we have to see why this change, the applicant wants to make the change. And also in case of incomplete or wrong documentation provided. For example, if documentation is provided for the wrong EU number or uh, there are documents missing, for example, labeling or mock-up files, please remember that in case of comments to the mock-up, the comments have to be also implemented in the labeling. So we want to see mock-up and labeling files resubmitted. So both files must be resubmitted. Can I have the next slide? So on this, on the, on the next two slides, um, I'm going to present you the, the mock-up and the labeling. What are the differences and what are the requirements? So let's maybe start with, uh, let's start with the mock-up. So why do we request the mock-up? Because this is a recent requirement to add it to the, to the submission of the initial notifications. So in order to improve the quality of the outputs uh, and also to speed up the process and to minimize human errors, we are of course turning to artificial intelligence to help us to achieve that. And we are testing a tool called Assisted Validation Tool. And this tool requires specific files in a specific format. Therefore, a mock-up has been recently added to the list of document, documents required as part of the submission of the initial notifications. So what is the mock-up? The mock-up is just a flat design of the outer or intermediate packaging in full color. So we want to see the mock-up in the way it's going to be put on the market for the patients. And we also, uh, the mock-up also um, contains the text for the outer or immediate packaging in, in case of relabeling and the text for the inner packaging. And the mock-up must be submitted in the text editable format. This is one of the requirements of the new tool. What does it mean? It means that individual words 
um, can be selected with a cursor, can be highlighted. So if you can highlight individual words on your mockup, it's in a correct format. And the mockup, and also the mockup uh, must contain all information required by the annex, including human readable data, just terms, expiry and lot, and the unique 2D identifier. We just, uh, for the purpose of the mockup, we are happy to see a placement, a little square, or just to indicate where uh, 2D will go on the final box. Why do we ask for uh, all information from the annex to be present on the uh, inner labeling? Because the initial notice cannot be issued based on the single batch. Therefore, we need to see all information from the annex, even if part of this information is present on the originator. Because products might be sourced from a different countries when the language might be different. Uh, if the uh, list of member states of origin is, for example, contains uh, 30 countries, there is a possibility that in the future, the product might be sourced from one of them, where, for example, um, lot expiry or the name of the active substance or certain abbreviations might differ. So that's why we would like to see all, this, all these elements in the language of the member state, states of destination. Exceptions can be made to the name of the product and the strength, because this will not differ, will be the same in all the languages, and also to certain terms, like the terms and abbreviations from the Appendix 4, and only for certain languages, um, the languages with the footnote 6 and 7, when on the blistered and immediate small packaging, uh, lot and expiry can be uh, put without terms and abbreviations. Can I have the next slide? So what is, what is the labeling? So the labeling is the file that contains images of the outer carton in case of reboxing or fully labeled outer carton in case of relabeling and also uh, fully labeled inner packaging. And please remember that all images must be in full color and must be of a good quality. So we, we will be able to see all information. So in case, so here you have, uh, I just put a few examples. Uh, there's one outer carton, the pen, bottles and blister. So in case of the new label covering the original name and the strength of the product, we require to, to send also an image of the original product with those elements fully visible. This is just to make sure that we use the correct product and the correct strength. In case of blisters, the text might be printed directly on a blister or on the label. And again, in case of the label covering the entire blister, we also ask the confirmation that the label will be of a good quality, but will be thin enough not to impede a removal of the tablets. And again, if uh, the blister covers the name and the strength, we would like to see the original. Can I have the next? Uh, this slide is just a short reminder to follow the naming convention for all the files submitted. Um, this is, uh, so the standard naming convention should be a year, month and day, followed by the product name, underscore last three digits of the EU number of the product and the subject. And Below you see a few examples of subjects and the list is again not exhaustive. For more uh, subjects, please refer to the parallel distribution FAQ, question five, how to name each file. So then the subjects can be cover, for cover letter, leaflet, mockup, labeling, etc. Just to rem remember, that the file should not be longer than 100 characters and 
couldn't and mustn't contain any special characters, uh, nor be password protected or have any security settings. Otherwise, we won't be able to open it. Can I have the next? So what are the annex requirements for the submissions of the initial notifications? So uh, always the latest, an the, the latest version of the annex uh, must be used, which can be found on the EC webpage or on EMA EPAR. Also, sometimes yearly updates can be used, but only in cases if all previous variations are included. There is an example of Avonex below. I'm not sure if, if it's well visible, but this example shows um, th that the yearly update can be used because all the previous variations from the past year have a statement updated with and um, and the number of the of the year of the yearly update. So you can see them in red. So all the free variations are included in the yearly update. So this is the latest to be used for the purpose of the initial notification. To the left, we, we see the same Avonex on the EMA EPAR. So we can see that the, var the, the variation is 187G, which is included in the yearly update. So the yearly update in this case should be used. Just a reminder, uh, if we look uh, to the left, to the EPAR uh, picture, that the date of the of the of the annex is is uh, can be found next to the name. So in the case of Avonex, is 11 of February 2021. Please do not look at the last updated, because this um, might not refer to the product information itself. It can be other information or other uh, documents updated. So please always, for the purpose of the initial notification, please use the date next to the name of the product. Um, and uh, uh, one more information that the yearly updates can only be found on the EC web page, website. They are only published on the EC website. You won't find them on, on the EMA EPAR. And the last point uh, refers uh, doesn't refer to initial notification. It, um, it refers to the safety updates because we receive uh, questions about the correct annex to be used for the safety updates. So maybe just a very brief clarification on safety. So applicants have three months to implement changes related to safety. And we strongly recommend to use the annex mentioned in the monthly list. And the annex is published on the parallel distribution, distribution regulator, regulatory and procedural guidance webpage. In case of using a different annex, for example, a more recent annex, the applicant must ensure that the annex contains all the changes related to the safety. It might not be the case, so it's always safer to use the annex mentioned in the monthly list. In case of doubts, applicant can always contact us via Ask EMA uh, platform, uh, providing as much information and details as possible uh, about uh, about um, about the case, ask the question, provide um, the product and um, all information. More information is better because this will this will ensure the correct routing and the faster uh, reply to the query. Can I have the next slide? And this is the last uh, slide. So uh, you can see the list of all the useful website or doc documents that the parallel distributor should check regularly because they are, uh, especially the FAQ, which we update uh, and the most answers to most questions can be found there. Please also use the checklist for uh, initial notifications and annual updates because the checklists were prepared to facilitate the submissions. They, they have tick boxes to, to ensure all the points are addressed before the submission is made. So we believe that this will limit the number of errors, the errors that may lead to invalidation or a negative outcome. 
And please also note that there, there are also IRIS guidance for the registration parallel distribution to the uh, guide to the applicants, and also the list of centrally authorized products and the procedural and regulatory guidance. The slides contain active links, so you, if you click on those links, you will, you will be uh, redirected to the uh, relevant web page. And I believe that's it. It's the end of my presentation. So I give the floor to my colleague, uh, Francesca, who is going to present annual updates. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you, Kinga. So this part of the presentation will be focused on annual update, and we will start to showing you a video on how to create an annual update and scope of changes in IRIS. Then we will move to the annual update, why we sometimes do refer to annual update as a dual procedure. We will also explore the purpose of an annual update, scope of changes, and then we will have some example of frequent mistakes in the form. Next slide. And now we have the video. Video recording on how to submit annual update through IRIS portal. Click on submission and then select my draft submission. Click on create new submission and the system will redirect it to a new submission uh, page. Click on organization as you are applying on behalf of an organization and click next. Please note that this is a test environment. So we are selecting the address of the European Medicines Agency with the UK address. Click on select location and select. Tick the box of your location and click on select. And now you can move on submission type. Please type annual update and click on the magnifying glass. Click and select. Move to create and next. Please note that the system might take a couple of seconds. From this page, you can add managers and contributors clicking on the blue add button and continue to submission form. On this submission form, you will find a reference number for this draft of annual update. We strongly recommend to take a note of this number as you might need later to create a scope of change. Please, please make sure that the required section have a green tick to the right. Once you have completed the section, a green tick will appear next to it. Now, please provide a purchase order number and you will find this on your invoice and your account number. And then click on save and return. As you can see, there is a green tick next to the, your section. Now you can move to details of parallel distribution notices and you need to fill the product name. So click on the magnifying glass and for this testing, we have choose Transima and click on that. Now the system has found Transima and select. Now you need to indicate the pharmaceutical form again in the search toolbar search for solution for injection and click it. As you can see in the drop down menu, you have more than one solution for injection. Please ensure that you have ticked and selected the correct one and select. Now you need to include the member state of destination. And in this case, we have chosen Finland and click 
and select your member state or destination. Please tick the box if, with yes or no in case you are informing EMA of any changes to the selected notices. And for this one, we have chosen yes. Click save and return. Now you need to, the, to fill the document from applicant. Please note that we are adding only one file for demonstration purposes, but you will need to add more files as indicated in the checklist for annual update. And we have selected the files and click on add files. And the system is uploading your file. As you can see, you will, the system will show all the documents attached. Click on the yes. And in case you are adding a text comparison report, click on yes. Please also provide the date of the information used. In this case, we have chosen February 2022 and click on save and return. Please note that you don't need to fill documents from EMA section and you can move to the declaration section. If you are not reporting any changes, you can click on submit, move to the declaration and then submit to your application. In case you are informing the agency of scope of changes occurred during the past year, you need to create a scope of change for this application. Click on return. And now we will create a scope of change for this annual update. Again, select organization and next. Same for this part. This part is essentially exactly the same as shown before. Location type, click on select, and submission type. In this case, it will be annual update scope of change, and click on fine. As you can see, the system will show annual update scope of change when you want to report changes, and create, and next. Again, the system will require to add managers and contributors. Please click on the adding button in case you want to add more managers or contributors and click on continue to submission form. Now we, you are drafting an annual update scope of change. As you can see, the system has generated a reference number for this scope of change. Now you need to fill the submission form with all the information you are including and amended. So please, you need to ensure that you select the correct reference number. So please insert in the search bar the number and it might be useful to start with the star as the system will help you to find the correct reference number and click on select save and return now you can move on details of the parallel distribution and please note that we are adding to the initial notification so we need the reference number of the initial notification previously submitted and click on file. As you can see, the system has found your initial notification and click on add. And save and return. Now you can move to the section in case you are adding or removing details of their packager. 
you can also add or remove member state of origin or add or remove member state of destination natural repackaging in case you want to add reboxing or labeling or remove one of the repackaging method and also you can include or remove source presentation for this application we choose to add or remove details of repackager and we will click on this section now we are adding a repackager so we need to find the record for the repackager and for demonstration purposes we will choose this one and click on add as you can see the system has linked this new information to the form and click on save and return Again, you will see a green tick next to the section you have completed. Now you can click on return. And you have the annual update for Rencima and an annual update scope of change for Rencima where you added the repackager. Now you need to go to the drop down menu, go to edit draft for the annual update, click on edit draft and then choose declaration. Read the declaration and tick all the boxes in order to proceed to the next step and save and return. Now you can submit your application. Please tick the box and click on declaration and submission. This is, you have the option to review the application or to submit. In this case, we are submitting the application and the system is processing your submission. Please note that it might take a couple of seconds in order to the system to complete your application. Now you will see that your application has been submitted. And just a quick reminder that you will receive the video also with the presentation. So now we will move to the to annual updates to the to the slide. And before starting in, in getting into detail what an annual update is, uh, we would like to remind to to applicants to use the to consult the public register prior to, to the submission. Uh, it's important to consult the public uh, register because you will find uh, all the products that have been uh, checking to be in compliance with, um, with the marketing authorization and the EU legislation. We also recommend to applicants to, to before submitting uh, your application, to check the guidance in advance to the submission. We, you will find in the in the parallel distribution section on the EMA website, uh, the annual update checklist and also some further guidance, like for example, the frequent and answer questions, the IRIS guidance, and the annual update checklist. We also want to remind you that in case of you, you have general queries regarding the process or uh, um, specific product related queries, you can always contact the parallel distribution secretariat through the, the form available in the Ask EMA section of the EMA website. Um, we want also to stress again the, that there is a cooling off period of 24 hours from the submission to redraw the application and in case you withdraw the application within this window, 
uh, the application will be free of charge. After that, uh, a fee will be payable to the agency. So applicants should therefore review all the information on the form and all the supporting documents prior to the submission. A mistake could lead to invalidation or negative outcome, while the fee will be still remain payable to the agency. I will not go into, into detail of the grants for invalidation or negative outcome, as uh, my colleague King already explained that um, um, is a not is not an exhaustive list and uh, it should serve uh, only as a guidance. So next slide, please. So why do we refer in our guidance and also in our correspondence to annual update as a dual procedure? It's called dual procedures because you are implementing the changes and then you are informing the, the agency about these changes with the next annual update. Annual update is to notify the agency of any change occur to the medicinal product through the last year. So let's, in order to give an example, if you have submitted an initial notification last year in June 2021, your annual update notification birthday date for submitting the annual update, it will be due now in June 2022. Changes are implemented by the PD and then notified to the agency through the, the annual update procedure. The annual update should be submitted for all active notices. Next slide. So what's the purpose of annual update? With the annual update, you can combine all the scope of changes occurring within one year to one pharmaceutical form of a medicinal product with one member state destination. It's same and maintain an up-to-date database. And for annual update, we do require to see the product how it's currently brought to the market. So please include in the submission color copies and color copies, they need to be clearly uh, enough for us to assess. So please provide all the side of the box and all the side of the, of the inner packaging. And please also include any educational material that you might have with the, with the presentation, like for example, patient alert card or calendar sticker. I also do remind you that According to the checklist, you need also to submit in the submission color copies and mock-up as indicated in the checklist for annual update and already mentioned by my colleague Kinga. Next slide, please. So what is a scope of change? A scope of change should be used when in addition to revision of the product information in line with the update annex, APD was to introduce or to remove something from the initial notification. Like for example, you want to add or remove member state of destination or member state of origin, or you want to add or remove repackagers or repackaging method, and to add new uh, source impact size presentation. When you don't need to create a scope of change, when you are only updating to the latest annex. And when you have a no change annual update, you have a no change annual update when you don't have any new information. So the product has been distributed, has been distributed in parallel for the past 12 months with no change to the product. So there is no new annex, uh, and no change in the scope of the initial notices. So you are not adding member state or region or destination, no new repackaging method, only a new change to re the repackager. Next slide. So uh, you can see from this slide that we are compiled some frequent mistake that we have identified in the form. So in the first example, you have in the notice held by your company, you have as a member state of origin, Austria and Germany, as a member state of destination, Austria and Germany. 
In this scope of change, the removal of Germany is indicated, the removal of Germany as a member state of destination is indicated. This scope of change is incorrect because in this case, while you need to, to indicate the removal of Germany as a member state of destination, you need also to indicate the removal of Austria from the list of member states of origin because you are not allowed to source and distribute the same product in the same in the, in, you are not allowed to source and distribute in the same country the second example is on the contrary a correct way of indicate uh, the removal of a country as you can see in the member state of origin list is indicated ireland and uk northern ireland and in the member state of destination, you have Ireland and the UK, Northern Ireland. This scope of change is correct because there is the removal of Ireland as a member state of destination and the removal of UK, Northern Ireland as a member state of origin. Next slide, please. So, this is another uh, typical example of a frequent mistake in the form. For this example, we have chosen Remvela, which uh, is uh, for presentation U003, is authorized as a bottle without outer carton. In the scope of change, there is an indication of addition or reboxing as a repackaging method. This scope of change is incorrect and it will lead to invalidation because the product is marked as a bottle without outer carton. And in this case, the only repackaging method possible is relabeling. So in this case, the, all the information required by the annex uh, as FMD uh, requirements and uh, the leaflet itself, it will be need to uh, attach directly on the bottle. The fourth example is uh, about adding a reboxing as a new repackaging method. As you can see, in the initial, the repackaging method approved was relabeling. With this scope of change, the parallel distributor is indicated the addition of a reboxing as a new repackaging method. And with the submission, color copies for reboxing are provided. And in this case, this scope of change is correct. Next slide, please. Then we are moving to a pack sites not, reportedly con not reported correctly. As you can see in the packaging details, there is an indication of sourcing U003 to distribute as U002. The scope of change it says addition of the pack size, but this addition of the pack size is in the wrong text field because this addition is indicated in the free, in the free text field instead of the source presentation field. So technically it's correct, but the, present, the, but the scope of change is, uh, uh, is indicated in the wrong section of the form and this will lead it to invalidation. And next slide, please. And this second example, there is a correct indication of an addition of source presentation. This is a, in the correct field of the source presentation field, and there is an indication of sourcing U003 to distribute as 002. And this is correctly indicated. I would also like to remind you that when you are sourcing and distributing the same presentation, so when you are sourcing, let's say, U001 to distribute U001, there is no need to indicate or to report as addition of, a, of a, um, a pack size presentation. For some presentation in particular, like some blister, I also want to stress that you need to check also in the list of authorized presentation that the U number you wish to add 
a source presentation is in the same type of blister. So the primary packaging material is the same. Because it's not possible to source presentation that are in different type of blister. For example, in Vega, for in Vega, there are two different types of blister for the same strength. We have prolonged release tablet blister OPA aluminum and prolonged release tablet blister PVC aluminum. These are this thick presentation with specific type of blister and they are not interchangeable. And I think this is my end of the presentation and I will give the floor to my colleague Marlos. Thank you, Francesca. Um, hi everyone, I will do the last bit of the presentation. Um, it's just a brief one on some product specific requirements. If I can have the next slide, please. Yeah, we'll start off with some general remarks on multi-packs and color schemes, and then um, some more product-specific cases that we come across quite often um, on Renvela, the family of pre-sailers, and on Capra. If I can have the next slide, please. Thank you. So um, when you are creating your um, outer packaging for multi-packs, we'd like to draw your attention to the following, because often in the annex, as you can see on the right-hand side, it is um, specified what the outer packaging looks like. So this can either be an outer label with a blue box. And in these cases, the intermediate cartons will be um, held together often by um, a see-through wrapper or a foil. And then the outer label will be put on top of that. <coughs> um, so that's one option. The other option is that it is specified that the outer packaging is a box. And this is your classic outer carton where the intermediate boxes will go inside. Um, because it's specified in the annex what the outer packaging looks like, we cannot accept any deviations from that. So when it is specified that it is an outer label, um, and if you do submit an outer box, then we will have to ask you to change it to be in line with the annex. So please um, be mindful of that when you're creating packaging for multi-packs. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. And just a brief note on um, color schemes. Um, they kind of come in two types. So some color schemes are included in the annex, mostly in the package leaflets. And PDs have to follow the annex and adhere to the color schemes when they're in there. Um, but in addition to this, <coughs> an originator's packaging can contain um, design elements that relate to the product safety. So they've been included to support the safe and correct use of the product. And these design elements could be, for example, colors for strength identification. So your five milligram is blue, your 10 milligram is red, things like this. Or they could be uh, more prominent fonts for um, uh, like administration uh, use. So it could be things like once daily or oral use. Um, and these little phrases will be printed on, for example, on the front panel in bold and red or in more like prominent fonts. Um, in these cases, in the interest of the, pa for the, pa of the patient safety, um, we strongly advise parallel distributors to align uh, their packaging with the originator's products. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, yeah, Francesca touched upon Renvela 003 briefly as well. <coughs> so as she has already said, this is an author press presentation as a bottle without an outer carton. Um, we have seen a few instances where um, parallel distributors proposed to distribute this as a bottle with an outer carton. And the reasoning for this was often that they had to adhere to the um, requirements of the FMD, the Falsified Medicines Directive. Um, unfortunately, we cannot accept this and um, I will try and explain briefly <coughs> the reasoning behind it. Um, so um, in case of parallel distribution, the requirements of both the marketing authorization and the falsified medicines directive must be met. Um, the first requirement is laid down in a legislative act. So this is regulation number 726, 2004. And according to this legislative act, the parallel distributed medicinal product has to meet the conditions laid down in the marketing authorization and in the EU legislation on medicinal products. Um, so this is a legislative act. Um, however, the conditions of the FMD, the Falsified Medicines Directive, are provided in a delegated act. So these requirements of the FMD, because they're in a delegated act, they cannot prevail over the requirements um, of the legislative act. 
So following from this, <coughs> this means that parallel distributed medicinal products must um, adhere to the Legislative Act first. So first they must meet the conditions of the marketing authorization, meaning that Renvela 003 should be distributed as a bottle without an outer carton. And then um, uh, next to that, or like secondly, um, they need to um, adhere to the requirements of the FMD. So this, in practice, this means that the particulars for the falsified medicines directive need to appear on the label that is on the Renvela bottle. Um, can we the next slide, please? Yeah, just a quick note on the family of presaders. I think most of us are familiar with this by now. Um, just to point out to you that it is um, specified in the annex that there is certain information um, on the administration of the product that needs to be printed on the inner lid of the outer carton of the unit pack or on the inner lid of the intermediate carton of the multi-pack. And because this is <coughs> specified in the annex, this location, um, we cannot accept any deviations from it. Um, so we cannot accept the information on the on one of the panels of the outer carton or on a loose cart. Um, so please bear that in mind when you're preparing um, any of the um, of the presalers. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, and lastly, this is the last point <coughs> is on the oral solution for Capra. Uh, this is a press release from a few years ago. Um, but we wanted to point it out in any case. So um, cases of accidental overdose have been reported with Capra oral solution. And most of the cases occurred when the medicine was used with a wrong dosing syringe. So for example, a 10 milliliter syringe was used instead of a one milliliter one, leading to a tenfold overdose. So to avoid medication errors and the risk of overdose, parents and carers are now advised that only the syringe provided with the package should be used to measure the dose of Capra. And um, in order to ensure this, the different medicines, cartons and labels will be colored differently and clearly indicate the volume of the bottle, the volume of the dosing syringe and the age range of the child that the medicine should be used for. You can see the pictograms on the right hand side here. Um, they're also available in the press release and these are the ones that need to be printed on the um, outer carton. Um, that was it from my side. I'll hand back to Virginia now and then we go on to the Q&A session shortly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marlos, and thank you to all the speakers uh, for the presentations and all the hard work in organizing the webinar. We're running out a bit ahead of time. Apologies for that. I still want to have enough time for a Q&A session, so we may be overrunning around 10 minutes. I hope uh, you can still remain with us. But as I say, all the questions will be published uh, in our website, so we, you will have the responses anyway. And again, we will uh, share the recorded video, we will share the presentation, and we will share also all the videos that have been uh, shown today. So you will have all these materials. So now quickly, I'm just uh, handing over to my colleague, Anna Fyodorova, for the Q&A session. So over to you, Anna. Thank you. Uh, we received some questions during the registration process, so we tried to cover most of them in our presentations, and we have also picked up a couple to present here. And again, as already mentioned, all questions which we receive uh, with the registration, as well as those which you have posted, uh, we will publish a, um, a document with questions and answers. Um, we might not be able to um, take all of them um, at this uh, moment. So one of the questions we received uh, um, uh, concerned um, whether the parallel distributors are obliged to implement or to use packaging materials that we used for the annual update, or they are allowed to implement new packaging materials six months counted from the date of the annex. And the question comes from the fact that um, a separate um, a document is prepared for the annual update according to the latest annex. However, the annexes are often released just before the submission deadline. Thus, in such cases, parallel distributors would be forced to discard all packaging material from their stock. So, um, just a reminder that annual updates should be submitted in line with the annex, which is mandatory for use at the time of the submission. So, you do have um, time to implement the annex. So it will not always be the latest published. So six months implementation period applies for um, regular annexes and three months for safety related changes. 
Next question, please. Um, how would be parallel distribution impacted by the implementation of the PMS, positive or negative impact, and how would be the impact if with the upcoming TADI web forms? Would the process change? Would Iris be in sync with PMS and OMS? And how would how it would support parallel distribution? So as I mentioned earlier, um, Iris consumes information from PMS and OMS. OMS uh, integration is fully functional, um, so is PMS. However, it is still undergoing further improvements. But in general, PD procedures are quite simple ones with relatively simple data dependency. So um, improvement with uh, PMS integration will simply um, eliminate the instances when IRIS does not contain yet the um, EU presentations of newly approved products or newly approved uh, EU presentations. Next slide. Um, we also received questions with um, regards to the contact options uh, for exceptional cases. So you're aware that there is a possibility to submit questions and inquiries by ASCII main service desk, but the waiting time in some cases is too long. As an example, some EU uh, numbers or products are not in the EMA submission database, and sometimes the um, parallel distributors face very short uh, tender deadlines, and in seldom cases they need fast support, as otherwise they cannot attend the tender. So um, if during your submission of initial notification, you face a situation when you cannot find a product presentation in the IRIS, please log a service desk ticket. This requires IT support. And um, again, as mentioned earlier, the more detailed you are uh, in your inquiry, the faster it reaches the um, intended recipient. But in general, bear in mind when planning your submissions that EMA has the established handling time. So if that um, may impact the tender, please uh, then plan your submissions um, in advance. And next question. Um, we also received uh, several questions and suggestions for improvement uh, of IRIS, such as the um, issue of missing product presentations or an option to select all member states of origin in one go. Um, some questions related to the fee, in particular a possibility maybe to introduce invalidation fee. Um, we have taken a note of your feedback, of your suggestions, and we will take it for, uh, for consideration. And again, just a reminder that um, the questions uh, and answers will be published. Uh, we have received quite a few questions in the chat box. I can see we have provided some replies. Uh, so colleagues, um, we had a question uh, related, let me go to the beginning. Um, okay, Francesca. Yes, I can take um, a question regarding that we are receiving in uh, the chat box. It, the question is, could we submit new source presentation through annual update if EU number differ by blister type, for example, PVC, PA, PVDC, aluminium, and a clear PVC aluminium? Um, I covered this when we were talking about uh, how to add correctly a source presentation. And in this case, it's not possible to, to add this, even if the, the strength is exactly the same. Because for some presentation, in particular for blister, you need to check uh, also in the list of authorized presentation that the primary packaging material is exactly the same. So it's not possible to source presentation that are in the different type of blister. Uh, as for example, in Vega, for in Vega there are two different type of blister for the same strength, and we have prolonged release tablet blister OPA aluminium and prolonged release tablet blister PVC aluminium. 
And these are distinct presentation with specific type of blister and they are not interchangeable. And uh, um, they are not interchangeable also because some product, they might be a sensitive product and got approved for different uh, climates. So therefore, uh, to reply to the question, no, is not possible. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. We have also uh, received a question whether it would be possible during the submission of annual update to omit some of the notices. And the well, the answer we provided here is that it's not really possible. Technically, system will not allow this because once you input the search criteria, uh, such as product name, uh, pharmaceutical form, and um, country of destination, and the system will simply bring up um, all uh, notices which match these search criteria. And uh, we mean active notices. So dormant or uh, withdrawn or cancelled will not be uploaded by the system. Um, we are um, really started exceeding the time for, for this webinar. So um, we will provide the responses to, to your questions in writing and compile document. And um, we very much appreciate your participation, your active uh, role in it. And uh, well, I hand it over to Virginia for the closing um, words. Yeah, thank you, Anna. And uh, we apologize that we ran out of time. We would have liked to take more questions live. But uh, in any case, uh, if there is anyone from the audience that has the remarks, we may can take uh, maybe one or two in case there is any burning issue. Otherwise, I mean, as I said, we'll be providing written response uh, to all the questions. We'll be publishing them together with the video and the slides and the uh, presentations and uh, pretty much everything that you've said today. So I would just like to thank you to all the speakers and for the hard work and to everyone that uh, has made this uh, webinar possible. And I would like to also thank you, the participants, for the questions and for being with us today. Apologies, we ran out of time. But um, be sure that all your questions will be responded and uh, you will have access to all the replies. So thank you very much. And uh, have a nice rest of the day. <laughs>